Before we start, I just want to reiterate, this is Ben Ueda's design, and if you listen to the Modern Maker podcast, you know that he's perfectly fine with sharing designs, as long as you credit him. Given the interactions I just showed you on the screen, I think I got a seal of approval. So Ben, thank you for the awesome design idea, and I'll link the video in the description. You know when you meet someone, and after some time, you meet their siblings, and then later on, you meet some of their cousins? That's kind of what this is. I know it seems silly, but what I mean is, sometimes these people all look like variations of the same person. That's because they share genetics, kind of like these tables, and although the implementation is different for each one, they all have the same core idea. Today I'll be showing how to make the tall end table that I displayed, but using some of these concepts, you can honestly make any of these tables. To start, I went and bought a melamine board from Home Depot. This board is 24 by 48 inches. All the research I've done shows that this is the easiest and quickest way to make a concrete top. Ultimately, your approach will really depend on the size of the concrete top that you want to make. Right here, I'm stripping about an inch and a half from each side, and this is just to create a form for the concrete to sit in. This whole build is entirely possible with a circular saw and a drill, but since I had a table saw, I figured it would make it a little easier. After each wall was cut to size, I attached it to the melamine base using screws. I also recommend making pilot holes into each wall, just so the melamine doesn't break when you're driving the screw in. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, here's an example. The idea is to pre-drill a hole using the drill bit, making it easier for the screw to go in. Once you're done, be sure to clean up the space so that the dust doesn't get inside the concrete. Next, you can line up each edge with silicone caulk. After that's done, you can run your finger through each edge. The idea is to round it over. Just like anything else we do, all the planning and preparation in this step will lead to less trouble later. Keep in mind that the more attention you pay to detail, the cleaner your edges will be. I wanted my concrete to look a little more like, well, concrete. So I was intentionally more careless than usual, and I really liked the outcome. Long story short, if you want smooth edges, be careful with the preparation. If you want rough edges, be a little bit more careless. At the risk of getting judged here, I am exposing my Crocs. Anyway, once the caulk has dried up, you can go ahead and mix the concrete, then pour it into your melamine form. Most of the tutorials I've seen mix the concrete outside of the form and then pour it in, but in my case, I haven't had any issues doing it this way, so I'll continue to do it this way. I then grabbed a scrap piece of plywood and flattened the top. Right after I was done, I used a reciprocating saw to vibrate the form. Some people use an orbital sander, some people do it by hand, other people use hammers. The idea is to vibrate the form and force out any air bubbles so they don't affect your concrete. I would recommend giving the concrete a minimum of two days to cure before trying to take it out. Otherwise, you're increasing the chances of it cracking. And to take it out, do the same steps as earlier, but in reverse. Don't forget to be conscious of the weight of the concrete tabletop. I used an 80 pound bag, so I was definitely cautious when turning this over. To seal the concrete, I used Quickrete's high gloss sealer. I started by turning the table over one more time and then sealing the bottom. Someone on the internet said this would help with the dust, and because everything on the internet is true, I know that this must be as well. But really, I just wanted to try it for myself. I think it did help. I turned the table over again and then sanded it down using an orbit sander and 600 grit sandpaper. Concrete is known to have some harsh chemicals in it, so be sure to wear a mask when you're sanding the concrete. The same logic applies for mixing it, like we did earlier. After giving it two coats, I just let it dry overnight. Then I realized I forgot something. You know, just for good luck. Since the concrete takes at least two days to cure, it's a good idea to build the frame while you wait for that. I set up a stop block to make a ton of repeatable cuts at about 20 inches. This would be the width of my table, but then again, you can always make it whatever size you'd like. 
I set up another stop block at about 39 inches. Given that the tabletop is about an inch thick, this would result in the 40 inch height that I was looking for. I wasn't looking forward to sanding all these pieces, but I really wanted it to have a smooth finish, so I knew that I had to. In terms of sandpaper grit, I usually go from 120 to 180 to 240. If I'm feeling bold, I'll do a Spider-Man pose, otherwise I'll just lay down and sand comfortably. Alright, so when it comes to the staining, the process is actually pretty simple. I have two rags here. I'm going to use the first one to soak the wood, and then the second one to wipe it off. That way it's all done once it gets to that point. For the stain, I used Verithane's Early American. Like I mentioned earlier, I usually set myself up in stations when I'm staining. I pretty much just soak the wood the first time around, and then I wipe it off with a clean rag. That way it dries quickly. After very much sanding and staining, we had all our pieces. Next, I had to set up my drill. I used Craig's pocket hole drill bit. We're not necessarily making pocket holes, but you're gonna see the method in one second. The electrical tape is just there as a guideline to ensure I'm not drilling through the wood. I felt that these screws would be great for this application because they're specifically designed to pull one piece of wood towards the other, as opposed to just holding the wood in place. All right, so when it comes to the actual design, bear with me because it can get a little confusing, but I'll try to explain it as best as I can. The two long pieces of wood both represent the table legs, and the two pieces laying across them represent the width of the table, which means that this will be the foundation for the bottom and then the middle shelf. The middle shelf had to be about 15 inches higher than the first one, so that's what I'm doing right now. I'm spacing them out. With the stop that I created for the drill bit, you can see that the drill bit gets about halfway in, and then that's when I put the screw in. The side we're working on now is actually the top. And to set up the top, we're going to create a spacer block. So line up two identical pieces, but then take the top one off and screw the other one in. We need that gap to be there because it's part of the design. We'll see a little bit more as we go. I know it's hard to see it now, but it's going to create an alternating sequence in just one second. So now that you've figured out the pattern, lay another tall piece on there. Repeating these steps a few times will be what eventually builds the legs. One thing to note is that you should be alternating the screw patterns. Think of it like this, if you're screwing into the exact same spot every single time, your actual screw is not going to have anything to attach to because what's under it is going to be already taken out by the drill bit. I hope that at this point, some of the alternating patterns are starting to make a little bit more sense. So in theory, this piece would be standing tall, and it would actually have a third leg right here, but we're going to attach that later. You're going to follow that exact sequence twice, and that's going to give you all four corners. Now we can finally attach the two pieces together, and we can also play a game called Hide the Screw Hole. And to play this game, you just have to be conscious of where the screw hole is going to be. That way you don't leave one that's exposed. I'll give you an example. You see the holes that we just made? Those are going to be on the top and the concrete's going to lay over them. So you're not going to see those screw holes. And in this case, we just turned the table upside down. We're applying the same logic. We're hiding the screw holes because we're making it on the side that's never going to be exposed. You're pretty much going to have stretchers that run across the length of the table. There is space for four stretchers on the side that's closest to the concrete, so we're just going to attach all those, again keeping in mind that we want to hide the screw holes. Now we're turning the table right side up, and because we put all the holes on the bottom, you shouldn't see any here. Prior to this, we couldn't attach the third leg on each corner because we had nothing to screw it into. Well, not at least without exposing the screws. So playing that same game of hiding the screw holes, we're lining up the third leg where it needs to go, but we're also drilling the holes from the inside, that way they're not exposed.
And now that that's set up, we can start making the shelves, which is actually a slight adjustment from Ben Ueda's design. I figured that adding the shelves would make it a little bit more structurally sound, and on top of that, it would have a little bit more utility as well. I didn't measure these out, I kind of just approximated based on what looked right. But here's the trick. For both sets of shelves, I added a dab of wood glue under each piece, and I gave it about half hour for the glue to dry. Once that was done, I turned the whole piece upside down so that I could secure each wooden slat with a screw. So in this case, the glue is just a placeholder. And that's not to say that wood glue wouldn't have done the job. I think it would have done perfectly well. The thing is, it usually requires a little bit more preparation. And I think that we would have made a little bit more of a mess in our case. Right, so at this point we were done with the screws, but I wanted to add another little feature that would help this whole thing be a little bit more forgiving. I ordered these screw-on furniture leg adjusters, and these are great because if the table were for some reason off balance, I could just adjust it. And of course, I added a little furniture pad, just so that the table wouldn't scratch the floor. Alright, so we're getting really close to wrapping this project up. I vacuumed it one more time, and then I gave it a clear coat. This was done to accentuate the color of the wood, but also to provide practical protection for it.